Thank you, Andrew. In mathematics, generally, the first problem has a long history, and I apologize to the experts. I'm going to be as historical and elementary as I can be uh, in describing the problems. Well, does that cover it? Yeah, okay. So we begin again with the primes, the sequence of primes. Euclid knew already knew that every number can be expressed as a product of primes, every number bigger than one, as you see here. And he used that fact to prove that this sequence never stops. If it did, if there were only a finite number, you could multiply them together and add one, and you would have a number that was divisible, or bigger than one, which is divisible by no prime, and that would contradict the fact that Every number is a product of primes. So Euclid did never, never did state that the fa factorizing a number into primes could be done in only one way, so-called unique factorization, fundamental theorem of arithmetic. But he did state the lemma from which that theorem, state and prove the lemma from which that theorem is an easy consequence, the lemma which exemplifies what it means, what primality means, namely that if a prime p divides the product of two numbers, then p divides one or the other of them. Uh, <clears throat> around 1750, we make a big jump, around 1750, Euler uh, considered a function which is now called zeta of s, and which is defined by this product over the primes. And the fact, this equality, that the product over the primes is equal to the sum over the natural numbers, is an analytic statement of that unique factorization. Namely, of course, the proof of that equality which holds when these products and sums converge, namely for s greater than one, is simply to expand this, <coughs> this uh, factor of the product into a geometric series, and then notice that in the product of those series, the, the result is a sum in which e each term is obtained by obtaining, by choosing one term from each of the <coughs> for each prime and of course choosing one for all but a finite number and in that way since each number is uniquely a product of primes this is true this equality and it is, is the analytic formulation of the unique factorization with that uh, Euler improved a bit on on Euclid's proof of infinity of primes namely as any good calculus student can tell you that by the so-called comparison test, the sum of the reciprocals of the numbers is infinite. And if you take the logarithms <coughs> and use this equality, that shows that the sum of the reciprocals of the prime numbers is also infinite. Although to it, take, <laughs> it gets infinite very slowly if you want to get bigger than three or four, you have to take primes out to several million. Euler also evaluated, got, got famous by evaluating that function zeta at s equals two, that is by summing the series of the reciprocals of the squares. But if, now, if one wants to think more about the, the way primes are distributed, uh, one has to get more quantitative and introduce the following functions, traditionally called pi of x, is the number of primes less than x. For example, pi of 10 is four, pi, the number of primes less than a million, uh, sorry, a billion, is about 50 million, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, how many primes are there less than s? 
around 1800, Gauss, just by experimenting, guessed that the probability of a prime around <clears throat> a, a number x being of a number near x being prime is the one over log x, or equivalently. Uh, that pi of x was approximated very well by the integral logarithm of x, which is defined there. And indeed, if you, if you uh, make a graph where, say, out to 100,000, x to 100,000, and pi of x, and plot it against x, and draw it, then within a very fine pencil line, these two functions would coincide. Fifty years later, Chebyshev introduced this modification of the function pi of x, which is technically better, and proved a relation between that, pi, that capital pi of x and the zeta function of Euler, which is written this way. And that's the theme of this problem, the relation between the distribution of primes and the zeta function. Uh, Chebyshev also showed that if there were some reasonable approximation to pi of x, uh, in a certain sense, then that approximation would have to be the logarithmic integral. Then came a big breakthrough, and I decided I'd start using color. Uh, around <clears throat> ten years later, Riemann reversed, was able to, by, a sh he showed that the zeta function made sense for all complex numbers, different from one, where it has a, a pole, and indeed satisfies a functional equation rel relating zeta of one minus s to zeta of s, and he could, <clears throat> by using the complex argument and uh, a Fourier analysis, a Fourier inversion, and evaluating an integral by summing the residues at the singularities of log zeta, uh, he proved the following thing, that the p capital pi of x, which gives you the distribution of primes, is the integral logarithm minus a sum of the values of Li of x at the places where the zeta function is zeta function is zero, and the first uh, Clay Prize problem, Millennium Prize problem, is the famous Riemann hypothesis to prove that if rho is a complex number such that zeta of rho is zero. And it's not one of the trivial, so-called trivial zeros, and minus an even integer. Then the real part of rho is equal to one half. In other words, the, drawing the complex numbers here with zero here, one here, and i there. There are the trivial zeros here: two minus two minus four minus six. All other zeros should lie on this line. Real part equal one half. Riemann himself computed the first few. The first one is up around, with, up, up around 14. And uh, he estimated, gave an estimate for the number of zeros up to a certain point and said it looks like there are that many on the line. But after a few quick attempts, he gave up. And this was in 1860 or so. And uh, since it wasn't necessary for the immediate purpose, which, let me emphasize, was to relate, give a formula for the distribution of primes in terms of the zeros of the zeta function. So famous explicit formula. Well, that was 140 years ago. Uh, whoever solves that problem will have earned his prize. Some of the, many of the very greatest uh, mathematical minds in between have thought about that problem. And uh, have failed to solve it. On the other hand, there's every reason to believe it's true. Uh, at least 
there's a lot of numerical evidence. The, uh, the first uh, 1.5 billion zeros going, starting up are on the line. That goes up to a height of about 500 million. Uh, Andrew Adlisk, there's some reason to think that if there is a zero off the line, it might be up at higher than that, and in various intervals, there was some idea about that, and Andrew Odlisko checked that in, all of, in various intervals, up to a height of 10 to the 20th, all of the zeros in those intervals are on the line, and that comprised about 10, 100 million zeros in all. And then, <clears throat> theoretically, it is known that about 40% of the zeros are on the line. So, that doesn't look so good, but that is proven. Now, I somewhere failed to mention that, that the problem of showing those zeros are on the line is equivalent to showing that Li of x is as good an approximation to pi of x as it could be, namely the error is, per, is of order of magnitude square root of x times log x. You, and it's theoretically known one can't do much better. The idea is if you could prove all the zeros, for example, were to the left of the line three quarters with real part three quarters, you would get a three pi, x to the three quarters log x. Nobody can do that for any number less than one, even. And the best errors in, this, in the estimate of pi x by li x are obtained by finding zero free regions, but which, which tail off and get very thin as you go up. Okay. Now, <coughs> there's the... Perhaps, however, the main reason for believing in this uh, Riemann hypothesis that the zeros are on the line has to do with uh, some analogous cases in which it has been proved and is highly non-trivial. Uh, the zeta function is a, is a prototype of a general kind of function called a, uh, an L function, which is defined by an Euler product, I didn't say it, but that product over prime numbers and products similar to that are called Euler products, after Euler. It's defined by an Euler product in a right half plane and is expected, these L functions are expected to satisfy a functional equation. Uh, I can't define the most general one, but uh, following a suggestion of Serre, if you have any finitely generated integral domain, you can get a function of this type, generalizing the Riemann zeta function simply by replacing the product over the primes, which are, which generate the maximal ideals in the ring of integers, by taking a product over the number of elements in the residue fields of the maximal ideals in that integral domain. So if if the integral domain is the ring of integers, which is often denoted by z, following Bourbaki, uh, then you have the Riemann zeta function. But for any ring, you get a function, and it's conjectured that the zeros and poles of that, of such a function are on the line, on the lines real part equals an integer or a half integer. And this is true if the integral domain is of characteristic greater than zero, that is, if a, adding one to itself a certain number of times, you can get zero. Uh, that was, that's a long story which I won't go into, but for special one-dimensional rings of that type, Emil Artin suggested it should be true in his thesis. Hasse, pro Hasse proved it for the case of curves of genus 1. They proved it for curves of arbitrary genus and suggested a very interesting story which should be true for rings of higher dimensions. 
and that was proved by Deleen, the, the, the famous they conjectures in the early 70s. And finally, let me just mention the extended Riemann hypothesis, is, which is that when you replace z by a ring r of integers in an algebraic number field, that this zeta r of s, this so-called Dedekind zeta function of the field, satisfies a Riemann hypothesis for every number field. That's the extended ERH, extended Riemann hypothesis, and its uh, truth would imply all sorts of things, which I haven't got time to go into.